Thank you, Morty. I'd now like to introduce um, our Student Advisory Board co-presidents, Andrew Levin and Ann Song, who have been absolutely fabulous to work with uh, these past few years. And they will introduce our speaker, Ambassador Faye Hartog Levin. Hello, everyone. As she will tell you, Faye Hartog Levin, I checked that, graduated Northwestern with a degree in Russian language and literature. She was not one of those students who knew what their path was going to be. But as you will hear from her talk, Ambassador Levin, the child of Dutch immigrants to the United States after World War II, understood the world was filled with possibilities, and she went for them. Until relatively recently, Ambassador Levin was the 65th ambassador of the United States of America to the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Now, she is a senior advisor to the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and a senior advisor on international strategy at the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. Impressive as these accomplishments are, equally impressive is the way in which Ambassador Levin has leveraged her extraordinary professional success to serve the causes for which she clearly holds an abiding passion, education and the arts. Trained as a lawyer, Ambassador Levin has served in Illinois State Superintendent's Office and worked on behalf of school boards, arts boards, private and public colleges, and social service agencies. We welcome Ambassador Levin as a Weinberg alumna who has served as a model for us as we begin our postgraduate lives, we hope with great professional and personal success, but also as engaged citizens who use our talents to help our communities flourish. It is our honor to introduce Ambassador Levin. Thank you, Anne and Andy. President Shapiro, Dean Mangelsdorf, Trustees Boglivo and Gray, Dean Otino, Associate Deans, distinguished faculty, family, friends, and most importantly, my future fellow alumni. Dreams do come true, and sometimes they even exceed your wildest expectations. When I graduated from Northwestern 42 years ago, I had hopes, dreams, and mostly doubts. I didn't know enough to fear failure because I had no idea what I was going to do next. Did I ever imagine that I would be asked to speak to Weinberg College graduates, that I would have any wisdom, or for that matter, anything interesting to share? Well, remarkably, I've been asked to speak to you. I have faced many challenges in my life, and I count this among them. And if one more person reminded me how wonderful Stephen Colbert's speech was at last year's graduation, I thought I might not even show up. Instead, I considered what I might share with you that would be useful as you distinguished graduates begin a new chapter in your own life story. Having left my expert speechwriters at the embassy in The Hague, and I did miss them considerably during this process, I resorted to conferring with experts here, my children and other recent graduates, to see what they thought I should share. Tell them your story, said one. Give them practical advice, said another. Talk about failure, offered yet another advisor. So I'll try to do all three succinctly. First, let me say that my children's college graduations were joyous occasions very different from their high school graduations. At their high school graduations, I had an immense sense of accomplishment and relief that both parent and child had made it to that milestone in one piece. But college graduation is an achievement that you singularly reach through your own efforts, making the decisions along the way, setting your own goals, and reaching them on your own. So I extend my congratulations to you for making it to this day and earning your degree. Now, what are you going to do with that degree? I wondered that myself 42 years ago. I chose Northwestern because it was a great university that had a strong Russian program and wasn't on the East Coast where I grew up. I picked a foreign language major because I had excelled in languages in high school and wasn't keenly interested in anything else. When people asked me what I planned to do with a Russian degree, I told them honestly that I didn't know. There wasn't anything mainstream to do with it. I envied my classmates who knew what they wanted to become, teachers, doctors, musicians. Their road was straight, their vision was clear. 
and I was overwhelmed because I had no idea what to do next. Society's expectations were changing for the better. Women had begun the feminist movement, demanding to participate in non-traditional roles. That was a good thing, but intimidating by the vastness of the universe being open to us. So how did I get here from there? I'd have to say that this is where aspiration to inspiration started, picking up along the way anticipation, frustration, and perspiration. After graduation, having nothing else to do, I traveled. Starting in the Netherlands, where I had strong family roots, I spent the better part of a year traveling and working odd jobs in Europe, including teaching skiing, kids, teaching skiing to kids in Austria. After that year of living dangerously, as I like to call it, I yearned for the opportunity to live and work in Europe, the Netherlands in particular, in some real job. I returned from that year of travel, worked at two entry-level jobs until I realized that law school was something that I wanted to do. I practiced law for 22 years until I began to ask the quality of life questions and wanted a change. I also remember quite clearly hearing a speaker at a networking event comment that a career is typically not a linear progression. There are many curves and turns along the way. This stuck with me, hit a chord, and I began to think about how work could be more than just a job. Along the way, I had married, had two children, divorced, and remarried. So when a friend, John McCarter, became president of the Field Museum in 1996, I said to myself, that would be a great place to work. I let John know that I was ready to change careers, and eventually we wrote my job description for the Field's first vice president for external affairs. One of my key responsibilities at the Field Museum was to strengthen the relationship of the museum with city, state, and federal government officials. One of those officials was the field state senator, Barack Obama. My husband had met him through a different channel, so when Obama announced in 2003 his interest in running for the US Senate, we were committed. Based on what we knew about Barack Obama, it was an easy decision, even though the outcome did not look promising. The rest, as you know, is history. Fast forward to November 4th, 2008. My husband and I had been active Democrats on both the local and national level. We had many disappointments along the way. But at the moment that Barack and Michelle Obama and their daughters came on stage in Grant Park to claim victory, we were never more joyous for our country. My husband and I believed that Barack Obama's election would send a strong, positive message to the world about American values today, and I believe we were right. There, there followed the greatest experience of my life, being appointed ambassador of the United States to the Kingdom of the Netherlands. The experience was a remarkable one for me on many levels. Nothing had prepared me for it, and yet everything in my life's experiences had prepared me for it. It was an honor beyond imagination and a thrill I compared to being Cinderella at the ball every minute of every day. It gave me a profound appreciation for the strong historical and economic ties between the Netherlands and the United States. The Dutch are immensely proud that New Amsterdam was our country's first trading settlement before it became New York, and that our first pilgrims were English refugees who had fled to Holland for 12 years before embarking for America from a Dutch seaport. But for me, it was a much more personal fulfillment. My parents had fled their Dutch homeland during World War II and in 1948 immigrated to this country. I was their fourth child, but the first American born in their family. So when I stood in the Hague's palace courtyard, preparing to present my diplomatic credentials to Queen Beatrix, being greeted by the star-spangled banner played in my honor, I could only think of my parents and how I wished they had lived to see that day. That day demonstrated to me that the American values that my immigrant parents had embraced were real, that I had returned to The Hague in a real job, and that dreams do come true. So why tell you this story? What are the lessons to be learned? The first lesson is embrace adventure and explore all the possibilities. When I was in interviewed by a young reporter after my arrival in The Hague, 
she asked me how all of my career shifts had prepared me to be an ambassador. My answer was that it was what I had chosen to learn from each of my jobs and life's experiences that had prepared me, not the experiences themselves. And that is a way in which your liberal arts education will serve you well. You have taken classes in any number of areas, and you have made friends with varied interests and backgrounds. That is how you have learned to appreciate and relate to a wide range of people and knowledge areas. My Russian major was of no practical application in 1970, but it has signaled to people ever since that I have long been interested in other cultures. When I was in a position to hire people in any job, I was happy to meet English majors because there was hope that there were people who still had the much needed skill of being able to write, as in sentences and paragraphs. That is still a highly sought after that is still a highly sought after skill in business, government, and nonprofits. Believe me, it's not all about texts and tweets. I did not have an abiding interest in history as a student, but realized after the fact that those who did had a much better understanding of today's world politics than I did. The study of history provides an understanding of the historical conflict among religious and ethnic groups challenges to the allocation of natural resources, and resentment over boundaries drawn by others. I have learned a lot from colleagues who majored in history. The second lesson is determine your strengths and then be creative about where you'll use them. You need a job, right? Or at least something productive to do? What attracts you? What do you dream about doing or where do you dream about being? In a recent Sunday New York Times article called My Brilliant Career, describing five people with interesting careers, the editor introduced their stories this way. As college graduates leave their campuses behind this spring for beach weeks and internships and entry-level jobs, it's worth remembering that careers are not built in a straight line and that sometimes the oddest jobs are the ones that matter most. For example, Jonathan Poneman, a record label executive, pumped gas at his first job. He learned that the gas station was not where he wanted to be and spent his free time in the record store next door. And that was when he realized that the people at the record store were more his type. Leonard Mladenow, a physicist who became a successful screenwriter for science fiction films, observed that when we're in college, we think about our future as a direct line from now to then from here to there. That's a fine life's path. But if you look at the careers of many successful people, you'll find that their route is often far more sinuous. And if you look at happy people, you'll find even fewer who traveled a straight line. And this is the beauty and gift of being young and at the beginning. The road is before you. It is filled with many beautiful and exciting turns. You can try anything and have time to change your mind more than once without penalties. There's no such thing as failure at this stage of life because the only experience which could be, which could be so classified is the experience from which you take no lessons. If you try it and you don't feel right or happy with it, you make a left turn or a right turn and try something else. So after all this advice, if you still don't have a clue, then this would be a good time to pay it forward. You do not need to wait till you're 45 to give back to your community. Do it now. Join the Peace Corps. Sign up for AmeriCorps. Work at a clinic in Africa. Build a school in New Orleans. Teach English in Thailand. Get out of your comfort zone. You'll never learn more about yourself and the world than when you experience a different culture. And so some programs even let you work off college loans. You'll never feel better about yourself than when you give to others. This is a powerful experience for which you do not need to wait. And finally, regardless of whether you are paying the rent with a well-paying job or getting by as a barista for a while, never underestimate the value of becoming involved in a political campaign. You will learn and understand more about how our country runs and what the values are in this country than in any political science class you could ever take. You'll meet people from different backgrounds with similar values. You will begin building your own network. Our founding fathers went to a lot of trouble to give us this intangible asset called freedom. 
A lot of our forefathers and mothers have died to preserve it. You will never appreciate it and realize its value more than when you actively become a part of the system that preserves it for all of us. A few weeks ago, Charles Whelan wrote a column for the Wall Street Journal called 10 Things Your Commencement Speaker Won't Tell You. Well, in case you missed it, I thought I would paraphrase two. The first, don't make the world worse. You are smart, motivated, creative, and well-educated. Everyone will tell you that you can change the world. They're right, of course, but remember that changing the world can also be changed for the worse. And I would add to that, be respectful of how precious and limited our environment and its resources are and how we have to do a better job of sharing and preserving them. And, this, and the second is, it's all borrowed time. You shouldn't take anything for granted, not even tomorrow. You should not regret your life's choices, and more importantly, will you be happy with your life and proud of it in 30 years when you look back? On this note, I will close and end with a poem that has been a family favorite by Kali Dada, a Hindu poet of the third century called Salutation to the Dawn. Look to this day, for it is life, the very life of life. In its brief course lie all the verities and realities of existence, the bliss of growth, the glory of action, the splendor of beauty. For yesterday is but a dream, and tomorrow is only a vision. But today well lived makes of every yesterday a memory of happiness, and of every tomorrow a vision of hope. Look well, therefore, to this day. Thank you, and congratulations, Weinberg Class of 2012. Thank you so much, Ambassador Levin, for that truly inspiring commencement speech. Thank you so much.